evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Thank you for joining us and for um, giving us some of your valuable time and assisting us when we um, take you through uh, this appreciation event. And we thank you for the role that you have played and the contribution that you have made in supporting our students. I'm happy to say that thanks to your contribution last year, you have supported more than 7,000 students through assisting them with their tuition fees, accommodation, as well as through providing them with meals. And I also want to thank you in advance for the support you've already given this year to our students. Some of you have made contributions in assisting us as we move our teaching and learning online. And that has made a valuable contribution to our students and to the way that they study. Thank you for that. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome our panelists. And I would like particularly to thank our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupe. Um, so most of you know the VC already, you've met him um, last year at our event. Um, Prof Kupe is the 13th Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria. Previously, he was, um, he comes from um, across the Yekske River from the University of the Witwatersrand, where he held the rotating Vice President Principal post for one year and also served as Deputy Vice Chancellor for Advancement, Human Resources and Transformation. I would also like to welcome um, Dr. Precious Moloy Motsepe, the co-founder co and CEO of Motsepe Foundation. She's also the founder and CEO of African Fashion International and of course, the Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. Dr. Precious Moloy Motsepe is a philanthropist, a businesswoman and a medical doctor. And she's played a vital role and has contributed significantly to the um, to the University of Pretoria. Thank you for that and welcome. Our next next panelist is Professor Tian de Jager, who is Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. He's also a professor in environmental health in the School of Health Sci Systems and Public Health and an extraordinary professor in andrology and also the director of the UP Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control. Welcome Professor de Jager. Last but not least is Professor Vanda Makota. She is the director of the Center for Viro Viral Zoonosis at the Department of Medical Virology, School of Medicine at the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, she is also occupying the DST um, NRF um, South African Research Chair in Infectious Diseases of, animal, of Animals, which is known as zoonosis. Um, Prof. Makota, welcome, and I know that you're extremely busy given the current circumstances, and thank you for your contribution that you've made to the COVID-19 effort already. Before I hand over to Professor Kupi, I would just like to point out that there will be polls that will pop, pop up during the sessions, uh, and any questions you have for the panelists can be sent by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to let us know if there's anything that you would like to ask or if you want to contribute to the conversation. Prof. Kupe, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for agreeing, agreeing to host this session, and we look forward to the discussion. Sorry, I think, Prof. Kupi, I think you are on mute. Oh, okay, sorry, yes. So what uh, I was saying not. is that some of you might have seen that I went off screen for two or three minutes. You had perfect timing because load shedding kicked in. And as you spoke, I was praying that when you finish, I'm back on and that's what's happened. This is the HCOM we live in. But today, a very warm welcome to all of our donors and also particularly to our panelists. Dr. Precious Moloi Mozope doubles up not as a panelist today only, but also as one of our major donors uh, in, in, in multiple ways, is one of the key philanthropists in South Africa. So a very, very warm welcome. This is our second year doing our donor appreciation and engagement uh, uh, event. This is very, very important. We'll hear many thank yous from you from us today. But this is my favorite and belief that a university community is made up not only of its staff and students and its graduates who are now alumni, 
but also fundamentally its, uh, its donors. A university of this stage and kind typically would rely on three sources of income, government grants and subsidies and student fees and tuition. And then a third element, which it comes from philanthropies, donors and others. So we greatly appreciate that we're that kind of university that can benefit from your, 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 your giving spirit, if you like, your sense of giving to others, your sense of also using your privilege to advantage others. Today, I've mentioned already uh, Dr. Precious Moloi Motsepe. She and her husband, uh, uh, Dr. actually Dr. Patrice Motsepe as well, honorary graduate of the other university where both of them are uh, uh, alumni. They are also so associated with our university. We do a lot of things with the agenda center that you think that uh, they are part of UP as well. In, they are graduates rather. They are part of UP without being graduates. I've noticed in the, in the list of who's attending today that some four other donors who are also alumni of the university are, have jo are joining into the event. One is a person who sat where I'm sitting right now as vice chancellor and principal, Dr. Johan Van Zee. He was a vice principal, vice chancellor and principal here. He is the immediate past chairman of Sanda, co-CEO of African Rainbow Minerals, former CEO of Sanda. He sat in this very chair, so he knows exactly where I'm speaking from. And he was one of those vice chancellors that made a huge contribution to the kind of university that we have now. And also he's a major donor of the university. From the United States, he's, he's also joining in. Dr. M Mr. Martins, who is the chair of our foundation in the US. One of the things we're doing as UP is to create foundations globally. So we finished creating the US Mr. Martins heads it. He's now moved from New York to Texas. And also he's going to be galvanizing our donors and friends of UP in that territory. We're also going to start a foundation in UK, Europe, foundation in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. We also have who has joined us today, our new president of the convocation, Dr. Hina Costa, who is also an alumnus, also a donor of the university, and he and the consortium uh, actually put, uh, put together money to create the th third largest in the world, Animal Research Feed Institute. The two largest are in the US, the third one is going to be in South Africa and HUP. Uh, uh, and, and this is thanks to Dr. Our, our President of Convocation, Dr. Hina Costa. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my main message today is really thank you very much. Without its donors, university is nothing and donors do two things they do not only provide the material resources as mr delport said student scholarship some donors also do other things as i mentioned dr costner build institutes contribute to infrastructure so for example african rainbow minerals dr patrice motepe's company contributed to the immersive lab that we have in engineering and other facilities uh, over there and we're also discussing other, other, further collabor uh, other further collaborations. So a uni a donors also actually express, uh, if you like, confidence in an institution. So when others see that certain philanthropists and donors are contributing to a particular university, they see it as a sign of confidence and as a place, if you like, you can invest in because there is value there and there's, there's, there's an institution that can actually contribute to transforming lives, to transforming sectors, to transforming our, our country, our continent, and also to making a contribution to the world. So again, thank you very much to our donors for that very reason. And let me share with you a few achievements of the university. See, in the last 18 months, but that predate my joining the university. Why 18 months? Yesterday, I clocked up 18 months as the vice chancellor and principal of the university. And so these are the things that we've done in the last 18 months. We have launched three innovation platforms. And these innovation platforms are going to be used to tackle the complex, complicated and intersectional problems that face South Africa, Africa and the world. I'm looking at uh, Dr. Professor Wanda Makota now because in February, if you remember Professor Makota, you invited me to open your conference with our collaborators at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, the top university in agriculture, research, and other things. 
And there you were talking about zoonotic viruses, which are the kind of viruses that uh, are like the, 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 cor the coronaviruses, if you like. I won't go too much into that, that is your territory. But this was before the lockdown and this was before this thing was spreading all over the world. Although I think in Italy, it was beginning, in, in China, it was showing up, but not necessarily in Italy. And so, and so it's, it's very, very important therefore that, that, that we have platforms, collaborative platforms where we bring UP academics, South African academics, African academics, global academics, and you tackle those things from an interdisciplinary perspective but with a very specific aim to solve that problem and to create a better society and to improve society. So those platforms we launched last year are the following. Future Africa Institute uh, um, uh, completed and launched then engineering 4.0, we completed uh, in February, it's ready for a launch, uh, but students are working already in there. That is all things digital in transport, but that even is a limiting description. The, the engineering point four is actually engaging with the Faculty of Health Sciences in helping them in creating models for their research. We also uh, launched the Javed UP Art Center, the largest university-based art center with nine galleries. And this is, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a mandate is to showcase the arts of Africa, not African art. African art is something that was coined by European anthropologists we call it the arts of Africa, because we also are an equally creative nation, or equally creative a, a, a continent, if you like. We are now busy building up, as I said, Dr. Hina Costa and, and his consortium, they're building up the Animal Research Feed Institute. We are also building up an area called Innovation Africa at UP. This is digital precision, sustainable agriculture. So all things agriculture. And here we're going to be working with all sectors of agriculture from the small scale farmer in the rural areas to the big commercial farmers. And we're going to, in that space, like Prof Makota and, and Wagengen, it's going to be the university and private companies creating innovation hubs and startup digital precision agriculture companies out of that space. This is the space where we currently, when you drive through our campus, you got drive via our cows and our lemons. We have another farm where we will move the cattle to. And I think that is where Dr. Hina Kostner and his consortium are building the Animal Feed Research Institute. So, so those are some of the achievements, if you like, of we We've done very well also in research. We're still the South African University that produces more research than any other. And where each per capita, our academics produce more research than any other South African university. Yesterday, when I woke up, which was my 18th month in office, because I'm active on LinkedIn, one of my LinkedIn connections said, you will wake up with a smile today. Do you know that UniRank has released their rankings today? UniRank uh, ranks university, 13,000 universities in 200 countries. And our, I didn't say anything today. I'm pleased to announce the results of 2020 by UniRank. Number one university in Africa, UP. Number one university in South Africa, UP. Prof. Uh, Dr. Precious Moloe Motsepe, Chancellor of UCT, you are number two on that one. <laughs> but you are our friend, so you are still number one on this one. And then number 183 in the world. So that's, that's the latest ranking, if you like, testimony to our, to our excellence. Second, we also leading still in sport, although sport is grounded. Last year we came Number one again in the varsity sports league. For three years running now, we're number one in that. Sports is one thing that we want to develop very strong. But of course, you might say this vice chancellor lives in cloud Kukule. He's talking about all of these very nice things in the middle of the pandemic COVID and says nothing about it. Now, allow me to say to you what we're doing about COVID. And I think the Dean of Health Sciences and Prof Makota from Health Sciences will say more. But let me also just tell you that we have 30 projects which are a university's response to COVID. And those 30 projects also have benefited from one of our large donors, Anglo-American gave us 70 million grant for COVID related uh, uh, responses. The Dean will be able to speak about that. But just in general, let my last count, uh, I think we raised 85, if not now 100 million uh, in support for COVID uh, issues 
because we face the following challenge. One, we could not do contact teaching because of lockdown and the virus. But the University of Pretoria is a very fortunate university in that it was very well prepared for online teaching. Since 1998, University of Pretoria has been doing a form of what we call hybrid teaching and learning. Hybrid teaching and learning is where you combine contact teaching with online teaching, even if the students are in class physically, if you like. So our, our philosophy is the following. You prepare before class, but your preparation are both physical, you might read textbooks or whatever, but you must also do things online, quizzes and all of that. In class, the lecturers might use a range of online uh, materials as well as technologies. But also after class, you must consolidate. So it's prepare, engage, and consolidate. The consolidation will also be online. So let me just give you interesting figures. So we created a big portal called UP Connect. Because last year, we invested 100 million in upgrading our IT infrastructure. So we didn't, our students needed, didn't need data to go online. They only needed data to write their assignments and tests because the traffic is often large. It's often slow, rather, when, when they are writing assessments. So we gave them, we asked them, for those who want data, please do. I think 15,000 out of the 55,000 asked for data. So we also needed to buy laptops. And Dr. Precious Motsepe Moleo, through the Motsepe Foundation, was one of our big donors. But Aspen Pharmacare gave us a sum as well. Samsung gave us also some, Nokia gave us some money as well. We also repurposed our budgets to the tune of 20 million to buy laptops for students. And we bought about 3,000 laptops for students. And most of our students, it turns out, take their own laptops and their own devices anyways. And 65% of our students, by the way, now are black. So of course, I meet certain people and some of my peers often accuse me of the vice chancellor with the majority of white students in the university. Our students are diverse. We want everybody, black or white, uh, in, in appropriate proportions, as long as you qualify to get into this university. So, one of our, so we solved that particular challenge. And our philosophy was no student left behind. And also, we didn't start online learning and teaching. We even delayed it by two weeks to ensure everybody had. For the students who couldn't get laptops, or if rather, if they got the laptop, they couldn't use it because no electricity, no connection. We've, uh, we've, we've catered for them as well. They get hard materials and they get two hours of tele direct telephone tutoring. On our, our, our learning and management system, which is called Geek Up, we have, so, we have thousands of uh, synchronous, that is live lectures with discussions on a daily basis. Our exams are happening online without a glitch, even in the in the load shedding uh, phase, only one or two instances have we had a, a, a problem. So we also had to very look at our financial status very much, something I'll speak about later on, because financial sustainability is key in this period. And we have repurposed our budgets and also looked at how we can manage going forward, taking particular financial measures. We believe we will get through this year. The university still enjoying, in the language of accountants, growing concerned status. In other words, not broke, not bankrupt, and not about to run about, out of money. And we will not necessarily, we will not be retrenching anybody this particular year, but we have to actually look at how long uh, the coronavirus and the pandemic lasts. But we will not resort to extreme measures of retrenchments. We're still hiring academics in critical areas because we said we're not also going to have a blunt austerity where we stop hiring even academics. We are only, if you like, stage managing appointments so that we save cash and we save, we save finances. So then also, of course, we have had a large response in the research and clinical domain. I'm leaving that to the, to the deans. So we see also COVID-19 as an opportunity at the investor of Victoria. We are anxious like everybody is. We stressed, we fearful, but also we hopeful that science, research, and other things, will, but also we're thinking about it as an opportunity to rethink our business, to rethink how we teach, and to develop further our hybrid teaching and learning model, something I will say something about later on. I must now stop here. I could go on. Investor Pretoria is one place where we never know where to stop. If I keep going about the nice things that we're doing here and how we have the resilience to, to respond to crises and pandemics, 
the, the panelists will be rendered uh, with no time. So let me actually really stop there. But before I do, again, thank you to all of our donors. We appreciate your support. We like working this journey with you. In turn, we believe in an impactful university that transforms lives, transforms communities and sectors, transforms the country, transforms the continent and makes a contribution to the world. So now let me turn to my panelists who have been uh, already introduced. And I will allow them each five minutes to speak about a, 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 a matter close to their heart, which they think this particular audience needs to hear. So I'll start with you, Dr. Precious Muloy Mosa. You are muted, Dr. Maloy. No, I okay, am. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Prof. Uh, and good, good afternoon to everybody. Um, and thank you very much for having me um, as part of your panel on this afternoon. Uh, of course, uh, I am Chancellor of University of uh, uh, Cape Town, but uh, you know very well that uh, University of Pretoria has a very special place in my heart because my son, um, our, our second son actually is a graduate of your university. Um, so uh, <laughs> Patrice and I started this uh, Mutipi Foundation uh, in 99. And our goal then, as it is now, was to increase access um, uh, for students to universities. And um, we did that because, um, I mean, in my case, um, and, and for both of us, uh, if I may say, we, were, we went through school, through university, through the help of other people. Uh, our parents, obviously, our teachers, our uh, university lecturers, the community played a very important role uh, in, in, in helping us to get to where we are. So this was about us um, dealing with the socioeconomic problems that our country has, uh, contributing towards development and ensuring that we can give um, young people on our continent an opportunity to access um, education and good quality education for that matter. So um, we currently have committed about 3,000 bursaries to all 27 universities in South Africa. And I'm very proud that some of our students are at University of Pretoria. Um, we decided uh, to join the Giving Pledge in 2013, and that was because we wanted to become part of this new wave of giving, of philanthropy, uh, being more intentional with our giving, being more strategic with our giving, and also um, linking with peers that we could learn from about um, you know, new ways of giving and new ways of philanthropy. We are based in South Africa as an organization. Uh, we have projects on the ground in South Africa, but our projects um, are also on the continent and uh, globally we work um, in partnerships in partnership with other um, organization. Um, my passion and I think Patrice's passion also is around young people and that's why we have focused on education, including moving to primary schools, secondary school, helping with infrastructure, at these schools so that these, the, the children can learn in an environment where they have laboratories, libraries, um, and, um, and are involved in sports, which I'm so happy to hear that uh, is also your focus because we know how a well-rounded child is able to focus on their studies. Um, it, it is important for their overall development. Um, and then of course the Bezaris program. But uh, on the whole, we're also very passionate about building sustainable communities. Uh, we work a lot um, with uh, rural communities in partnership with uh, leaders on the ground, such as your traditional leaders, uh, in partnership with uh, religious organizations and um, in partnerships with uh, universities like uh, University of Pretoria as well. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Precious Muloy Motseb. And you are right here. One of the largest contributors to student bursaries is the Mosebe Foundation. It is easily in the top two. 
So next, let's hear Dr. Professor Wanda Makota, and you might want to explain, you and I might know inside the invest what zoonotic viruses are and what those, but the our general alumni would like to know because you are the people in the in the eye these days, given we're facing this uh, pandemic, which is uh, of a global nature and threatens all our futures. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's really uh, a privilege to be part of such a positive event where we can really share positive information and say thank you. And we're not just um, trying to, to look at the next crisis around the corner. Um, so thank you for that. And um, as Prof. Kupe now said, he put me on the spot here yeah, now with the question of what is zoonotic diseases. <laughs> I think um, everybody um, should know the word by now because that is um, the diseases that we talk about if we talk about diseases spilling over from animals to humans. And with the current um, COVID epidemic um, or pandemic, we, we think it is a zoonotic disease. I use the word think because there's just a, there's so many unknowns that I can talk about for hours still, and that's probably why we still need a lot of research, not just in China, but throughout the world um, to really address these issues because there's, there's more questions than answers, specifically with, with um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so, I don't know, Prof, did you wanted me to talk more about zoonotic diseases or um, maybe how we um, are addressing research at the university currently um, in general? You can mix the two. Mix the two is your first So, um, I think things have changed dramatically um, since the COVID epidemic started. Um, I don't think anything can and will be the same. It's not just for research, it's, it's really everything in the country and the world. And I don't think it should be the same after something like this. So we really need to ask ourselves the questions on, on how should we adapt in a situation like this? It can't just be business as usual. Um, so I think from a UP research perspective, there was this immediate need that we need to address immediate questions and we had to reshift research to really do that um, very quickly because we, we need re really quick answers. But we can also not just focus on that. At, at some point, we're going to be post COVID and what then? So we, we also need to have a strong um, look into the future of how are we going to address research in the future. And Prof. Kupe mentioned um, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research. And it's something that UP is very good at. Um, we've, we've got lots of platforms that we initiated to do this. Some of it was mentioned in the introduction. But it, it really became our responsibility now. It's not just that something nice to talk about multidisciplinary research that we need to do. But if we really want to address the country's problems and also the continent's problems and even the global problems, this needs to be implemented. And there's, there's been a complete shift towards everything that we currently do has to be multidisciplinary, not just in talk, um, in practice. We need to do it and we need to design our projects and our research around this and also train our students to be able to adapt to an environment like a multidisciplinary environment. We used to train students very much in silos. <laughs> we don't really expose them. And we, we've really changed the way that we do things to really adapt to that. Um, so I think in, um, how research has changed at the university is really to implement these type of things and, and really do research that's gonna, gonna have an impact, immediate impact, but also a long-term impact after COVID. And we can think about specific examples. If we think about diagnostic um, testing methods. It's, it's became, it became a huge issue in South Africa, um, also in the rest of the world, where we don't have access to, to the international reagents and the international kits. It's at a huge cost if we have to import it with, with our exchange rate. So we, we really realized that we need to be able to, to develop these reagents in South Africa, these test kits in a research environment, but then also manufacture it. So I think universities are looking, and specifically University of Pretoria also at that final step also. We can't just put these things in publications 
and that's where it stopped. It needs to translate into products and really changing people's lives. And that is obvious in collaboration with, with several industries and partners um, that needs to um, be part of this. Um, and also looking beyond. So we can develop a test kit for COVID, but what do we do tomorrow if it's another disease? So we need to have platforms that can be adaptable. And that's the focus of what we do now. Although we need to immediately look at COVID, we're also looking beyond this and, and how we can adapt to high tech um, type of methods, but also low resource because we've got both in our country. We've got, we can do the high tech things, but we also need to be able to do low resource diagnostics, for instance, where we can go into a rural setting and give somebody a test result quickly that's reliable, that's been evaluated, that we know we can trust. So we, we need to look at all those aspects um, in terms of um, diagnostic development, in terms of developing platforms for vaccines. If COVID is not there anymore, how are we going to adapt our current vaccine platforms for a new disease? And we're going to manufacture it. We've got limited resources and we know that. So we, we, we don't have the luxury to just focus on one thing. And by the time that is gone, like COVID, we have nothing left to look at the other problems in the country. So everything needs to really have an impact post COVID. And that's been really the focus and the way that we've been designing and adapting to research in specifically the university research environment. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Makoja. The Dean is uh, having a bit of a challenge in this connection. It might be the power, the, the load shedding knocked him off. But I would like just here also, I was looking also at the attendees list. Is a person I need, just need to mention, partly because they've been great supporters of universities in South Africa and UP, and they retire from their job at the end of this year. It's a clear Digby from the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust. They've also supported our project for tutoring students who, can, who cannot uh, access our online platforms. There are very few, but they are, we don't want to leave any student. Here is also in the house, if this can be called the house. No, she's at her house, but she's in this house uh, for the donor appreciation. Thank you very much, Claire, for support to not just UP, but many, many universities over time and to the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust, of course. So um, now while we're waiting for the Dean Peps, I will uh, indulge the pro Prof. Uh, Makota and Prof. Uh, Dr. Precious Moloi Motepe. I understand I have to go to the, to the poll question now. Where is this poll? Uh, the poll question will appear on the screen. So people can then vote on the on the on the on the choice. There it is. It says, "How often do you want to receive updates from the University of Pretoria?" I can't influence your answer, but I hope it's as frequent as you can. I like to keep in touch with you. I like communication. Uh, being a professor of media and communication, I believe a community, which includes yourselves, needs frequent communication. But your choice and then we'll tailor it according to your choice. So that's the poll question. How often do you want to receive updates from the University of Victoria? I've seen questions also, someone has asked a question to the VC, with the, what will happen to donations given the financial crunch, crunch that universities face? And is the, the donations going to go to operational costs? No, it is an ethical principle that you do not divert a donor funds to purposes for which they were not given. So we will repurpose our operational budgets to deal with our operational costs. And that's why we are maintaining a sharp focus on how we spend and keep donor funding for what it is. Beyond COVID, we still want to keep your trust and we still want to keep that uh, principle that donor funds are for, our, uh, are for what was stipulated. So while we wait for the Dean, we can move on perhaps to our next set of questions. You were going to be first in this round, Prof Makota, but you just spoke, so I'll go to, I'll go to Dr. Maloy Motepe. It's really a question up to you is, how has the Motepe Foundation decided on what to fund? And also what you look for when you are looking for a cause to support in general as the Motepe Foundation, and given you are also part of the giving pledge. 
Yes, um, thank you for that question, Prof. Um, first, before I answer your question, let me just say what we currently doing during this pandemic, and you've mentioned some of that. As you would know, we made a commitment as a foundation in partnership with some of the companies that are associated with uh, the family, including, of course, um, uh, Sanlam, which uh, um, uh, Dr. Fanzel is um, uh, associated with, and um, and Arm and and the other companies that are associated with with the family, uh, and we made a commitment towards acquiring PPEs, um, primarily for hospital workers uh, during this pandemic. We know that um, uh, for us to win the fight with coronavirus. We need to make sure that our health care providers, the first line respondents are kept safe. So uh, PPEs for, for hospitals um, in, working in partnership with the Department of Health were our primary focus and objective. Um, but what has happened, and, and as we um, continuously try and look ways of stretching the, the you know, funds that we commit, we found that um, because, as you mentioned, a lot of small businesses are closing. Um, we tried to help small businesses, particularly um, women-owned uh, businesses, and as well as uh, some of our, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, black-owned businesses that are small, uh, help them to become part of the supply chain in procurement of these PPEs. So um, uh, you know that government is currently looking at the procurement bills, particularly trying to uh, incorporate women in the um, supply chains and um, for them to, to, to have sustainable businesses. So this was a, a, a beautiful byproduct of um, the commitment that we have made that we could also empower small businesses on the ground. Um, and, it's, and as you correctly said, uh, what the pandemic showed us was the stuck inequalities um, that still persist in our, in our society. So the, um, the urgency for us was to look at diverting some of our funding, um, not just towards bursaries, but to also look for funding to help students to access uh, technology um, because the, the, you know, the, the the digital divide was becoming very apparent, whereas some students were able to go online and learn. There were some students who were still, uh, you know, depending on uh, paper-based uh, modes of, of, of learning. And I'm pleased that um, we have a project that we have done together to help students um, access, um, uh, you know, uh, learning. So um, how, we, how we look at, um, you know, a, a pro proposals and, and how we decide on what to fund, which is your question. Um, firstly, we, we realize that um, as funders, sometimes we may be think limited in our thinking on how to help communities. So we do a lot of consultations um, with communities that we try and help. Um, we do roadshows annually, visit communities and ask them how best they think we can, you know, we, we can assist us. So there's that uh, community, um, you know, consultations, including schools, churches, and people on the ground. We also align ourselves with the sustainable development goals. And I'm pleased uh, to hear about your center for um, uh, SDGs. Uh, I was able to visit your, uh, I think you call it the future, the, the Center for Africa, is it? Uh, the Future Africa Institute. Correct, yes. I was able to visit that uh, last year. So um, the foundation also supports, currently we, there are, I think, 12 SDGs that uh, we support out of the 17. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that, that's a big area of our focus. Um, we also look at projects where we know that we can achieve scale. Um, you know, we know that the philanthropic dollar can only do so much. Mm. Government actually ha is more effective uh, yeah. than, than philanthropy is, uh, you know, in, in its scale and, and, and its budget. So um, we, 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 part we, we partner with government a lot and we also um, look 
at communities that are very impoverished, where there is high density, where we know we can reach more people. Um, and we, we would look at that. But um, now of late, we're also looking at impact investing, um, where we could form partnership, for instance, uh, with the private sector or universities, you know, or others, where our investment could result in a change um, that could impact um, larger communities. Um, the goal being to look at what policy changes are required to result in long-term sustainable, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 impact. No, oh, thank you. I know this is, is quite impressive, especially impact is an important thing, as you say, in critical mass and scale. And that is why at UP we have these collaborative platforms. They are ours, Future Africa is ours, but really it's a magnet to pull others so we attain that critical scale and mass, because then you have better impact in any, whether it's a philanthropic dollar plus university a dollar and the government's donor reaches more of our people. Uh, it, it, it wants me to say that uh, the Times Higher Education, one of the rankings, runs an impact ranking of university. And this year, UP, uh, you, are, you are asked to choose the number of SDGs you, are going, you want to be ranked in. We chose four. You are compulsorily ranked for the for SDG 17, which is partnerships. Yes. So in three SDGs, we came in the top 100 of, the, the, of universities that are ranked for, for their impact. Only two South African universities, let me say, have been brave enough to enter the impact rankings. <laughs> uh, if you want to know which ones, I, well, I've told you one, I'll tell, tell you which the, other, which, other, <laughs> which the other one is. But I think it's important, why the impact rankings are important is that universities often, we measure ourselves according to our own metrics and who's the star academic. But as Prof. Makota said, the real challenge is how does that translate into impacting lives and changing okay. society? Okay. And that is the same aim that philanthropists like yourself. Bob Makota then, I think the dean is still <laughs> not with us, so you're going to play in this space. I see on the panel also, which is an important question. People are asking, how far are we from getting a vaccine? <laughs> and, and so on, so we can weave that in. But the question I was going to ask you really is, using science and the research that you are going to do, are you able to do some predictive models from the science that you do to predict the next pandemic and how it might pan out so we are better prepared, we don't have to have lockdowns and hard lockdowns and risk adjusted strategies or not? How is the science developing in that? And what's the potential for us being a better able to handle you know, calamities of this kind? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you, Prof, for that question. Um, I think we, we failed dramatically with COVID. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work worldwide. We've done limited work in Africa, but we failed. And, and I think that is exactly what needs to change in the future. Again, things need to translate into something that's going to change people's lives. We cannot afford another COVID-19. We cannot afford these um, economic impacts worldwide. And there's, there's different ways that we can address it. And I think in the past, we were so focused on we've got time, we've got time, we can research and we can publish our papers. But I think now the urgency is there to really understand what is going on in wildlife in terms of pathogen diversity. But that's not all. We need to understand why those pathogens spill over. And, and that's been the limitation. We, we publish lists of it can be deforestation, it may be bushmeat, it may be wet markets. But we don't understand communities and societies and human behavior on that level and what drive these activities and how we can actually change it. Um, if people don't have food, um, that's going to be a problem. There's going to be contact with wildlife. You can't just say, no, I'm banning all wildlife, um, eating of wildlife. That's not going to work. We need to find solutions that's really going to be practical for societies. And I've said this before in some of my other talks, that societies need to be the focus of our research, of where we start, and then we need to work back towards the science and see what what 
what the science tells us. Because if we just work on the science and we decide this is the rules to not get a disease, but it's not practical for societies or within human rights, that is not going to work. And, and that is the type of things that I think in the future is going to save us from pandemics. And not just from pandemics, it's actually going to better people's lives overall. And we talk a lot about the One Health approach and um, that is specifically what we do at the Centre for Vital Diagnosis. And it's also a very um, big focus of the University of Pretoria, where we need to look at humans, animals and the environment. But this includes social science, it includes economics and going back again to multidisciplinary research. So if we want to predict in the future, this is what we need to do. It cannot just be like I do, go out and test bats and tell you there's so many viruses there. That's not going to um, save us from the next pandemic. My research needs to go further. We need to understand societies and human behavior. And that is multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. that, that will be true worldwide. Okay. There is a question on the panel for you. It says, it says, the question is, as a researcher, what would you say to donors? So I think thank you is the first thing. <laughs> um, we can't do it without donor funding. So there's long-term grants that we can apply for, you know, that's more structured. But I think what, what really happened during COVID is this immediate need for money and for funding from donors that had to make a difference on the ground. And it's not just for research, it's supporting my student with a laptop or making sure they've got food to eat so that we can really train the next generation of scientists. I may not see the next big outbreak. <laughs> I'm still along, I'm still here for a while, but the students are gonna be the ones that we're training to, to function in this environment in the future. And they need support on so many levels. Um, a hundred rand for data makes a difference on if a student's gonna finish a dissertation or not this year. It's, it's really small contributions on all levels, not millions for me to go and look for the next vaccine necessarily, but it's the small contributions that's really making a big difference at the moment in a student's life. Yeah, you stood in one of my lines I was going to give a young <laughs> To all of the donors, I was going to say every run matters. <laughs> so and, and, and we please. so we're going to start, for example, a crowdfunding operation for student support. You know, sometimes what we, what we think of at the investor of Pretoria and what I'm thinking is we should actually adopt some of the systems that are used in the US, where if uh, those students who are not covered by NEFSAS, say the fees is fifty thousand, and the family can honestly afford forty, and they pay forty and then 10,000 they can't pay. We would like a crowdfunding to say, yes, 10,000, and then put some social obligations on the student to give back from the support that they get. So I think yeah, your point is well made, but can you weigh, answer the question on the vaccine? How far next month? Mm -hmm. Sure, so like I'm, this I'm, month? I'm not the best one to answer that, Professor Marty from that shit. But I think uh, there's, there's lots of um, products on the market that, that's under investigation. And I don't think we, we really know if it's going to work yet. So it's, it's right at the beginning where this vaccine has been given to people. We're going to see if it protects people. And if I know they're talking, if we're only seeing a 60% protection, we might go ahead with that. But there's other challenges also. There's millions of people that's going to need this vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yes. It needs to be manufactured, it needs to be distributed. Um, so that the, having a vaccine that work in a small trial is, is, is not near giving it to everybody and making sure it's going to be available. So there's several challenges still with vaccines. And this is not just for COVID, it's, it's for all diseases. <laughs> I mean, we're battling to get measles under control in the country and things that we've got vaccines for for years. It, it is not an easy solution. So the first solution will, try, will have to be that we shouldn't see these diseases in the human population and we shouldn't get to the point where it's a pandemic. But if we are there, then we need vaccines is probably one of the, the best ways to try and, and, and really control the disease, but it's not a quick solution. It's going to take time. So transition back to you, uh, Dr. Mulemotepe, but there are a couple of questions, some of them directed to me, so I'll just answer them. Somebody's asking, Prof. Kupi, what do you believe are the trends in philanthropy and how will it change? There were two previous questions also about our exams happening online. 
The answer is yes. And they're actually proceeding very smoothly. We haven't been affected in our learning management system too much because it's on the cloud. And also that has uh, uh, shielded us somewhat. But also there was another question about what uh, students need, what, what, what we need for students. I think Prof. Makota has answered that one. On philanthropy, on the trends, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Moloe Motsebe might answer that uh, better than me because belonging to the giving pledge, they meet as philanthropists. I know from my discussions with uh, and, 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 and Patrice. But also in the house today is a, a, a gentleman called Ian Edwards. Ian Edwards is one of the top experts in the world around philanthropy. We at the University of Pretoria have engaged him because I know him from my past, or I rather selected him from my past as an advisor on, on increasing philanthropic income to the university. So he's not on the panel, but he's listening in the room because I think he wants to assess whether I'm taking the advice that he's giving. I think we have a meeting, on the, a monthly meeting on Thursday as well. Last month, we asked him that question when yeah. we had his advisory meeting. He said, this is very interesting in that it, actually the trend at the moment is not that philanthropic uh, donations are going down. As you heard from uh, uh, Dr. Moloe Mosef, they are going up to targeted things that have affected people in this uh, crisis. And also he said that just globally, crises of one kind or another often mobilize philanthropists to come to the party, but to support institutions and causes they believe in, but also institutions that they trust. And so that is why, as I answered the previous question, you cannot divert philanthropic donations to purposes that they are not meant, or administrative expenses that have nothing to do with the causes that philanthropists support. But I mean, let me transition by asking you two questions, Dr. Precious Mosefe Moloi, the reverse one to what was asked to Prof. Makot, what two donors do you think of philanthropists want to see among researchers and research institutions? And then what's the trend from your networks of philanthropists? Yeah, um, very important um, question at this time. Um, you know, we, we had a meeting earlier this year um, of a giving pledge that was uh, in Cape Town. And um, I think it was yeah earlier this year. And uh, that's when we started first hearing about uh, coronavirus happening in China, but it was still so far away. None of, I think people globally just didn't realize what this actually meant. Um, and my concern, I recall at that time, I asked one of our members, I said to them, you know, um, it's worrying that um, there doesn't seem to be a collaboration around these uh, pandemics, uh, mm. either from institutions like our ones or health or, you know, various institutions. There's very little collaboration that we saw. As though we had not learned from the Spanish flu and uh, SARS and all the other pandemics that, um, that we, you know, that have affected us. Ebola on the continent, um, you know, which was isolated. So that was a big concern that, the, uh, you know, for me, and I raised it as just a by the way question uh, without really thinking much about, you know, how, how we explore that further. Um, so listening to um, uh, 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 Prof. Wanda, um, I think we need to see more collaboration amongst researchers. Um, our pandemic preparedness um, really leaves much to be desired. Uh, mm. it, it, this is how we're preventing pandemics by locking ourselves in houses. And, um, mm. you know, it, it just means we just never had the right, uh, you know, systems in place uh, for, for infectious diseases. When actually one of us had warned us about the, 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 the you know, the terrible risk of, in, of uh, viral infections causing total havoc in the world. And we just didn't respond to that. So I think from, um, from, from the philanthropic sector, um, you know, it would be good to find partners within the research institutions, within other institutions where they, you know, people are building collaborations on preparing for future pandemics. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, going forward. 
Um, at this stage, yes, the issue of vaccines is very important. And what we would like to see also around the issue of vaccine is um, equity, that access to this vaccine is going to reach most of the poorer uh, people uh, in the world, that it's not going to be hoarded and uh, you know, used just in first world countries. And there needs to be clear collaboration around how we do this. Um, and um, universities, which are centers of you know, thought leadership, have to help guide society and institutions um, you know, uh, on how we do that, how, how we uh, deal with the issue of equal access to, to vaccines. Um, uh, secondly, um, from, from our side, you know, um, and I'm glad to hear Prof, you saying that um, you, uh, University of Pretoria has been ready for, for technology. I remember when I came to see um, the, that that, that, that uh, center for virtual, I think it, it was around mining, uh, yeah. where I made a contribution. It was really amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I w you even had 3D printing, uh, mm -hmm. which was really amazing for me coming also from the fashion world where I thought, wow, we're going to be printing clothes and printing, you know, jewelry. That was quite interesting. Um, so philanthropic funds have to find innovative uh, projects like the ones that you have and, and fund them so that we, uh, they can find, um, you know, they, they can reach a scale very quickly. And lastly, I think from us, from our side, um, we, we think there's an important case to be made for, for philanthropists to work with the private sector to help to create that link between education and the future of work, particularly where, you know, from where we stand uh, with uh, now technology really driving how we work, how we, how we uh, learn and how do we do things. Uh, it's very important for universities to ensure that whatever's taught within classes will support industry uh, going forward. Thank you. Virginia has now managed to join us. So we're supposed to be ending shortly, but we'll extend it by 10 minutes if everybody doesn't mind. Just 10, 15 minutes. Prof Maloy, I know you are very, Dr. Precious Maloy Mozepe, you are very busy, but I'm quite sure you can stay another 10, 15 minutes. It's an honor to be part of this. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Prof Makota, you too. <laughs> okay, Dean, so what, what, what's the faculty? How is the faculty approach this whole situation? Uh, could you give us just a high-level overview of the projects, the responses you are involved in, and what's the future for 2021? What's the faculty going to be doing? Thank you, VC. Uh, yes, uh, the faculty has been very busy. Um, and one would think since the start of COVID-19. But actually, without knowing it, we've been extremely proactive. Uh, last year already, were, our slogan was, now's the time for change. And when we started with 2020, we said, action is key. And we implemented many of these things in terms of technology, uh, in terms of 3D printing, uh, virtual reality, um, our upgraded skills laboratories, without knowing that we will be 100% dependent on many of these facilities and the approaches that we've taken, not only in terms of teaching and learning, but also in terms of our research approach. Um, just to mention that the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, SDG uh, 4, um, which is specifically referring to health and well-being, uh, the University of Pretoria is the only institution that ranked in the Times Higher Education rankings in this specific SDG, uh, and specifically, we in the top 200, telling us that many of the things that we implemented and currently doing in terms of One Health, uh, the zoonotic diseases, malaria, HIV, TB, uh, communicable, non-communicable diseases, many of these things we've been dealing with and preparing in terms of the African situation and to make an impact globally. Now, when COVID sort of started, I must admit we were well prepared. We had our sanitizers installed. 
we proactively had quite a, uh, a number of uh, PPE uh, in stock and we were one of the first that started with 3D printing of the face mask. Mm -hmm. But not only just for our supply at our local hospital, Steve Biko or Swane District or Kalafang, we decided to print 10,000 to make sure that we supply anyone in the front line that might need it with these uh, devices. Also in terms of research, we've been working on uh, 3D printed masks for TB and with uh, an institution, Leicester University in the UK. So it was an obvious thing to immediately say, okay, but how would this work for COVID? And many of the other research projects and initiatives that came from this, from modeling, total transdisciplinary approach within the University of Pretoria. So I must say, it's not just a Faculty of Health Sciences effort, it's a University of Pretoria effort with partners, because soon we realized we might have good ideas and we might have done a lot, but without mm. our partners and without funding, we're not gonna win the COVID battle. And the good thing is um, with institutions like Leeds University, we got some funding to get some of the COVID projects off the ground and to manage some of the, the issues and, and, and important aspects going forward. Now, obviously um, we've got um, departments like the Department of Family Medicine with a community outreach program that's been well known. They've already got half a million um, households that they've been working on. So the transition was good and the infrastructure was there to, to, to change it and to, to focus on COVID related issues. Many aspects related to it. Remember there's a lot of people out there that's um, addictive or uh, in terms of substance use and they could use that. Those helplines were activated to become not only um, substance use helplines, but care lines for COVID related issues. There's a lot of people on the street, hunger people, um, the outreach programs in terms of feeding schemes, in terms of um, housing and looking after the well-being of these communities. So it's vast. Um, vehicles that's been sponsored by Isuzu, for instance, to go out, to reach out, to get the equipment, to get the food to the people where it's needed. Um, in terms of learning, uh, our students, um, 600 devices sponsored by Aspen. So we could make sure that no student was left behind when we started implementing our online teaching. And the list continues. Um, we we are always in need of uh, um, ventilators and various equipment in our hospitals. And we're really working in close partnership with our hospitals. But there, for instance, Nissan came forward and with some innovative ways produced some uh, 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 equipment that's used now and in high demand in our neighboring hospitals. You know, USN gave energy drinks to our frontline workers. We're experiencing an extremely cold day today and we all had a good, most of us in any case, had a good warm uh, bed last night. But we must remember my colleagues and many frontline workers worked through the night under difficult circumstances and conditions without having a proper meal because they're too busy caring uh, for these people. And every donation, every bit that everybody contributed, you know, the, the, we can never have enough PPE. So out sure and Samlam, PPS, and the National Solidarity Fund, they all contributed to make sure that we've got sufficient stuff that our students are um, in a good space and safe, that our staff is protected under these uh, difficult circumstances. Um, so, yes, uh, 
VC, you, you asked me uh, what the faculty have done. The list continues, mental health. Um, we made sure we implemented programs at an early stage already. We partnered also in terms of the Crazy Socks for Docs campaign um, with uh, caring for the carers in terms of a, a program specifically for healthcare workers in terms of the uh, mental health. Food programs, um, the list continues. And going forward into 2021, I'm optimistic. I think we're all learning every day. Every day we've got severe challenges. It's going extremely difficult in the hospitals next to me on the one side, Steve Biko, and the other one, Swanee District. We've got Kalafong, Mama Lodi, Tembisa, um, Veskopis. A lot of challenges, but we're learning every day. And with the partnerships, the collaboration, and the support, um, we can only win this battle. And I think our students are learning from this to be innovative. We are learning from this to implement the wonderful technologies that's available. The question is, do our students still have to go into the hospital to do ward rounds? when there's software packages available and they can learn exactly the same skills in our wonderful newly upgraded skills laboratory. So yes, we're facing the challenges by taking on hands with our collaborators, our partners, and uh, looking into the future, being innovative. And I think, yes, um, at the end of this dark cloud, I'm sure there's something good waiting for all of us. Okay, thank you, Jean. I think we should now come to a close. So I'll give Dr. Moloi Motsepe and Prof. Wanda final comments and then I'll also then make final comments. Dr. Moloi Motsepe, your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kupe. This is a, a wonderful platform, and um, it's 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 wonderful to to be invited as a, as a donor to the university. Um, the, just to to the question about trends in philanthropy, and I want to challenge University of Pretoria and all the other universities. In um, uh, the, one of the new trends is financial incentives. Yes. Um, so my challenge to you is, especially in these challenging times. Number one, how do we get more students getting access to higher uh, education? And number two, if you produce more passes, if, if your students do better, the philanthropists should uh, incentivize you uh, financially by donating more. But thank you very much for having us today. We're taking up the challenge. I'm writing it into the performance contracts of all deans. <laughs> Of my good, yeah. so, um, thank you. Um, and I just want to comment on the collaboration question. So um, Dr. Malloy also said that it's so important. And in my experience, during the past two months, I've put in more funding applications with national consortiums than with international consortiums. And there's, there's definitely the shift in the nation working together and national um, partners. And this includes several universities as well as industry and, and, and institute. So there's, there's definitely, you can be assured that that's something that I think came to the forefront during this yeah. epidemic and I hope it will, it will continue. And then from my side, I just wanna say thank you on, on all the levels that we get support. Um, it makes a difference on the ground. It makes a difference in student lives. And it's important that we train the next generation of researchers and scientists. Um, and they are going to be the ones probably solving all these issues for us with their cre creativity and their access to technology and just being better with all of this than we are. So we thank you for the support on all levels, research-wise and, and to the students. Okay, thank you to our panelists. One of the common things they said, including the dean now, was the importance of collaboration and partnerships. And typically, a philanthropist supporting a university is a form of a partnership, if you like, towards a cause. Because as uh, Dr. Moloi Mozape said now, to give access to more people and to make sure they have been more successful 
especially if you have an institution of quality with facilities like the University of Pretoria. Let me just say that during COVID, the one thing that has thrived, uh, Prof. Makota has just said, is building more collaborations and partnerships, not just nationally, but internationally as well, as well as nationally. So I'll give you three examples in closing about, because we believe at the University of Pretoria, in, as you said, in an inter, multi, and transdisciplinary approach. The transdisciplinary is where the universities or the academics collaborate and partner with societal partners to solve complex societal issues. That's our mantra and our collaborative platforms. Remember, they are collaborative platforms to that. So since the lockdown, I think it's day 105 now, I've lost count. We've signed major collaborations with major universities, NYU in the US, where One Health is going to be one of the components of what we will do together. Rockefeller Foundation has come to give us some money to work more closely and identify transformative projects. Next week, on the other hand, I'm doing a virtual, we're doing the virtual signing. I'm doing a virtual signing with the CSIR, which is a South African national institution which used to have a close collaboration with UP. We are signing a major agreement next week to work more closely to translate knowledge into actual societal impact across the board. And CSIR, like us, is doing some things related to COVID. We also, together with Leeds University, got a two million pound grant, which we we signing virtually, I think, next week or the following week, to, to, on food security and food systems across the continent. Because we have seen that during the COVID pandemic, hunger, food insecurity, which were there, were simply exacerbated and they affected the poorer in our communities. And hunger, food insecurity contributes to not human being and wellness, as SDG4 does, wants us to do, but actually illness, predisposition to our diseases, and also weakened immune systems and all of that. So I think in, we, so we've been busy also during the pandemic with uh, building more partnerships and collaborations nationally, continentally, and across the, the globe. Half my webinars have been on partnerships and collaborations. And these days we all live on Zoom, as you know. <laughs> but I think we, our belief at the University of Pretoria is that we cannot let a crisis go to waste or every cloud is a silver lining. Beyond COVID, we must be better prepared for anything that actually comes out. So partnerships, collaborations are the way, and this is one. Let me end by again saying thank you to all our donors, Philanthropists that are here, every run matters. No amount uh, is, is, is insignificant. And we will, uh, once times are normal, meet you at one of our facilities. So last year we did this event at the Java UP at Center. This year we would have done it perhaps at Engineering 4 or at Future Africa. But the times will come when we can show you where your run dollars actually go or where they could go for those who are able to give more. But Thank you very much, much and deeply appreciated. And thank you for your time today to our panelists and to all of the donors that attended this function today. Thank you very much. Stay safe, be safe, and let's all come out together. We're in it together, safer, stronger, and working together. Our last um, a poll question is, how much of an impact do you feel your donation makes? And, 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 and we'll be grateful to get your, your answers in this regard. Thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Mloe Mosepe, Professor Wanda Makota, Professor Chiang Diaha. Thank you to our donors. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, friends of uh, the University of Pretoria and the Faculty of Health Sciences. Thank you for joining us this afternoon on a bitter cold winter's day. The reason I'm saying that is because we should not forget that last night, many of my colleagues worked under um, challenging circumstances in the COVID environment. Um, Patients were outside sharing oxygen in tents, and our students, volunteer and working long hours in the test facilities, 
and in some of the healthcare centers. The faculty try to be proactive in many ways. Um, we embrace transformation and therefore we last year already started to transform our facilities, our curriculum, but most importantly also our um, culture. And this, I think, to some extent prepared us for the unexpected COVID pandemic. But we soon realized we might be proactive in many ways, but without the sponsorship, without the partnership and the support from donors, we will not be able to win this battle. So I am extremely thankful for every contribution, small, large, in whatever way. And I would like to mention a few things in terms of the faculty that we've done. We've got a world-class skills laboratory, but with sponsorship of equipment, we'll be able to apply and adhere to the fourth industrial revolution in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of virtual reality, and we still need to expand on that. Um, this is going to help us in future in terms of clinical training. We embrace and support working on uh, the sustainable development goals, not only to make an impact locally or in Africa, but to have a global impact. And in terms of sustainable development goal three, health and well-being, the University of Pretoria is the only institution in South Africa that ranked in the Times Higher Education Global Rankings. And we within the top 200, telling us that the Faculty of Health Sciences is doing significant work and contributing to many efforts dealing with health and well-being. We've launched a media and marketing campaign. Um, so please visit hsup.co.za where you'll find many of the training materials, videos that we produce, actually more than 50 videos already that's COVID related to train and to educate not only students and staff, but the general public about this uh, virus. We've been involved in advising government in terms of strategies, and it, we regard the different uh, government bodies as our partners in this battle against COVID. We were very uh, proactive in developing an app and we still use it for staff and student management within the COVID environment. And our infectious disease specialist is in direct contact with everybody monitoring the situation on the ground. In terms of PPE, um, we've ordered a lot, but due to great donations from various bodies, we'll be able to supply all staff, all students with the necessary uh, equipment and protection. The University of Pretoria, the Faculty of Health Sciences specifically, in collaboration with UP Makerspace, produced and 3D printed 10,000 face shields, not only to help and, and to supply our hospitals, our staff and students, but the bigger, uh, to address the bigger need in terms of PPE and protection. Food provision for the homeless. Our Department of Family Medicine has been very proactive to address the issues related to the hunger, the homeless people, and the substance use of these people in programs with addiction. We've established a care line. Um, our community outreach program, together with some significant support from Anglo, I need to acknowledge, reached out and coordinated various efforts in the uh, communities. Currently, we've got about 50 outreach programs that is COVID-related, 
and research projects running uh, in collaboration with national and international partners. We've established a testing facility with NHLS on our faculty campus that's been um, very successful in testing uh, COVID uh, cases with volunteers from the faculty, also students helping out, working long hours uh, in this facility. But to the university, of course, the academic program is of importance. We made sure that no students are left behind. And therefore, we're very happy uh, about the donation of 600 devices that we received from Aspen. This made a significant difference in terms of student training and online offering uh, to our uh, students uh, in various programs. The hospitals we regard, obviously, as the key and the central uh, partner within this COVID situation. We've been working actively, looking at logistics, patient flow, airflow, modeling, various aspects, and we established Twani District Hospital as the COVID hospital. And um, uh, Steve Biko Academic Hospital, adjacent to us, uh, we've erected tents. The University of Pretoria supplied Wi-Fi because for the various apps, the uh, collection of research data, management of patient data, we dependent on um, a good, stable uh, internet connection. <clears throat> a COVID fund was established and we received various donations and we're very thankful for that. For instance, in terms of hospital equipment, 20 into uh, boxes developed uh, by Nissan, an innovative way of addressing incubation ventilators. Outreach programs by Isuzu and RBM, 30 buckets that were used to reach out and to go into the communities to address many of the needs uh, during this challenging uh, period. PPE from various donors like Outsurance, Sumlum, PPS, and I also need to acknowledge the National Solidarity Fund that contributed significantly. Then, in terms of our students, we need to take care of them. We don't want them uh, not only to successfully complete their academic year, but they need to get quality education and training. And also, in terms of their mental health, We've put various measures in place to make sure that we'll address all these challenges that is student uh, related. Also in terms of PPE, food accommodation for all those that are in need. So how did your assistance help the faculty in 2020? We received more than 26 million rand raised in various ways through research projects for different uh, initiatives. Your contribution is more than a donation. You actually became a life changer. And that is in line with what we're trying to establish in the faculty. We're developing life changes, our future healthcare professionals that is going out there changing lives and your contribution made you a life changer helping us building a stronger healthcare system going forward as well 2021 and the expectations related to the challenges that we're currently experiencing We'll have to look at new ways of teaching. Virtual reality and artificial intelligence to replace clinical war training. We need more equipment, world-class and new uh, software uh, instruments and packages. 
These are extremely expensive. But we need to look at alternative ways to make sure that our students graduate on time and get the necessary exposure and training in terms of what is needed. There's a much stronger primary health care approach, and we need to address that. Um, we should not leave any student behind. There should not be any hungry student, student without the necessary study material. And therefore, we created the Life Changes Fund. And this is specifically aimed at addressing the needs of students going forward during these challenging times to make sure that we've got bursaries available, grants to support them, that we've got money to feed those in need, and that we'll be able to supply PPE for those working on the front line. Ladies and gentlemen, the Faculty of Health Sciences has got a strong vision, a vision of changing lives. Um, but with your collaboration, your partnership, and your donations, we can change the world. I thank you.